I'm going to keep this really short. I do use Apple products. Um, you described me as a pragmatist earlier. I think that's quite a good description. But um, what I'm trying to do is really just to learn from you guys and girls and understand what makes development tick these days. I think Microsoft is doing a lot of the right things, but it's made some huge mistakes as well, as you know very well. The best way if you want to carry on the conversation after the beers or after tomorrow is Twitter for me, at ActionLam. I've also been described as a troublemaker, I think by James as well. Um, my favorite beer is made by a brewery called Black Sheep in the north of England. I won't tell you the story I was going to explain, but they're disruptive by their very nature. They did a deal with all the local pubs when they started up, didn't tell any of the other breweries, and then started up in the back door. But that's a long story, very short. The picture, I'm a big Dilbert fan. This is how things used to be. There's a huge amount that's changed around open source, both externally, around cloud, and particularly within Microsoft itself. So I do get paid to be into open source, but I'm not trying to get Windows or Office to become open source. What I'm trying to do is find projects that you're working on and find ways to make it easier to use Microsoft stuff if it makes sense for you. Try and get interesting people talking inside and outside the corporation and trying to move some barriers that simply don't need to be there. We do now write GPL code from time to time. We've done some big contributions to some interesting open source projects. This is the only slightly pitchy slide, which is just trying to bring out some of the things that work natively, properly, on the Windows platform. So this, the short form of this is, if you're writing an open source project, it may well work really well on a Microsoft platform. That's the only Microsoft you really bit that I wanted to talk about. James challenged me to try not to mention the company name in the talk, which, given response would be kind of tricky. But the point is really to engage. I don't think, this, don't think this applies to any people in the room, but I don't generally get jazzed by people who are paid to talk to me. I don't get jazzed by people who are doing something because it's between nine and five, and the job description says it's important. The people I like spending time with are people who work on their weekends and the evenings doing things they like, and they bring those things into the office too. Some corporations force people to work from a desk for no apparent reason, just because that's what they've always done. You've come across the consumerization of IT argument, I'm sure. You're probably many of the people who go into big organizations and disrupt by your very nature, and that's a really good thing. Challenging the, why do we do this? What's this for? If you're talking to a client or the people you work with, being told things like, you can't work from a coffee shop, you can't do various things that make no sense, naturally, probably everybody here would rise up against. From working for a big corporation, there's people like you who work in big corporations too. The people who often get in the way of the IT department. Now, some of you might work for IT departments. I once worked in a help desk. We used to have a sign above the leader's door, the team leader's door, and it just said no. Because everything you asked for, the answer was no. Because he was concerned stuff might break and he'd have to fix it. Disruption is a really good thing. Asking those difficult questions and being empowered to do things that are right, rather than just hitting the bottom line, is what probably most of us get out of bed for. But more corporations need to encourage that kind of culture. Measure, pe measure people by what they do and agree sensible goals, and don't micromanage how they do those things. I believe in karma in some ways. And I find that if I go to different events, be they technical, be they not, I usually get some value, but it's rarely apparent straight away. Main value is the people that I meet, the conversations that continue after I've met those people. Things that you help people with. My first use of Twitter was running late for a meeting coming into London. Jumped on the train, pretty stressed, trying to figure out what I was going to do in the meeting that was coming up. But at the back of my mind was, I've not had any breakfast. I'm really hungry. I would kill for a bacon sandwich right now. So I tweeted, where's the best place to get bacon sandwich on the way into London? And this whole other conversation started of all these people I didn't even know. I had four recommendations when I got off the train. That made my day better. So I find simple things can really, really help. But for me, collaboration and sharing and being transparent is really, really valuable. We know about cloud computing. We know about the opportunities that it brings. But I see people in government. I see people in businesses. I see people in charities who've got IT that simply doesn't work. It's slow. It's expensive. Back to the GDS situation, which the guy's doing a really good job. Many corporations have got exactly those problems. The PCs they run take five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It might as well be a week to boot. 
makes no sense. You wouldn't stand for that at home. You get order processes when you're trying to buy things from corporations that somehow break, and yet they don't put their hands up and say, terribly sorry, how can we make it better? They just kind of hide behind process and people. This is an amazing time to be into technology, particularly development, the way that so many things are now opened up that we can code against. I worked with Telefonica last year. They got a, a, a program called Blue Via, and that enabled developers to code against their back end. So a little bit like the talk earlier on this morning, without all the beer and sex and stuff, but the same basic idea of coding against the infrastructure that these corporations held and being able to make money from that. You absolutely can't hire all of the smartest people. Even if that was possible, the needs of what businesses need and what products are really interesting change so quickly. So big corporations like the one I work for, but many others as well, and government too, absolutely has to embrace people outside the room, outside the conversation, and bring those people in. Clearly that's what social media makes a natural thing for probably everybody here. But there's still too many people who hold things back thinking, well, I can't talk about that because it's all company confidential. Many things that are confidential by default don't need to be. Some things are for good reason. But having those conversations is what gives real value. The thing the best people have in common is passion. I'm into snowboarding. I had some lessons last time I snowboarded just over New Year. Would I want to be taught by somebody who's doing it because it was their job? Do you want to be taught by somebody to do something potentially life-threatening if you get it really badly wrong, who isn't really into it, is not as jazzed about it as you are? Same with horses. I fell off a horse about a year ago, and the only benefit of falling off the horse was I found that A, I wasn't the only person who'd done that, and B, the other people who were as passionate about it as me had great advice on how to get over concussion. The most difficult thing was, seriously, well, okay, it's obvious it's a dangerous sport. Don't crash horses. I'm passionate about other things too, but technology and getting benefit from technology is what really gets me going. I hate buying stuff that doesn't work. If I get stuff that doesn't work, like many of you, I'll share that with as many people as possible. But equally, I hate it when people keep things to themselves that could help other people. Don't settle for second best in anything is my motto. Think about the art of the possible. You've probably all worked with people who say it's, you can't do these things, or I'm not very interested, or it'll never work. The Kevin approach. No offences to any Kevins in the room. <laughs> but thinking about how things could be and focusing on those and driving towards those, whether that's being on the mountain and trying to figure out how on earth you do an ollie, which I still can't grasp, or even just stay on the board of that crashing half the time would be a bonus for me. But people really need to help each other more. You do that by being here. I was at GovCamp last week, 200 people in a room. The only thing they had in common was they chose to be there, the boss didn't send them, and they wanted to make things different, make things better. Interesting thing when you're hiring and you work in a big organization. How do you find out that people are passionate about what they do? If there's all these reams of process and people and organizations between you and people applying, then it's quite often difficult to get to the real things that happen. Social media is a really good way of short-circuiting that. Again, you probably use it by default. But would you really want to hire somebody who's not passionate about what they do? I wouldn't. The things that can be done by people who are passionate, the things that can be done by people who believe that things can be better, are absolutely amazing. I've seen so many incredible projects that have been run in pure open source technologies, purely commercial technologies, and more commonly, a mix of both are absolutely amazing. One that inspired me most was some crazy people who thought sending a mobile phone into space attached to a weather balloon and trying to use it for proper scientific research would be a really good idea. A team at the University of Southampton last year sent a telephone up into orbit. Well, actually, that's not quite true. They sent it up into the, the stratosphere, 60,000 feet. The hardware cost them 600 pounds. Every time they want to send that thing back up again, all they do is buy some helium, spend their time, which is obviously valuable and important, but no more hardware, they just send this thing up again. They're doing amazing research. They're using cloud computing to actually do real telemetry information. What happened? Sorry? Sorry. Dope. What can you do? The bizarre thing was that 
The phone was completely out of its design tolerances. No one knew quite how cold it would get up there, what the pressures would be, and all these kind of things. But what they did was amazing, and they're using this technology now to do real research, not just because they could. Not that big a balloon, amazing what it could do. You do this anyway. If you develop code, if you're doing it because you choose to, not just because you get paid for it, then you will absolutely develop amazing code. It's interesting how good things tend to come to good people. If you're doing the right thing, nine times out of ten, you'll get the things that you need to make everything else work. I really appreciate your time, and I'm really enjoying being part of this fantastic event. I'm going to be here tomorrow. You'll see me staggering around in the bar later. But please, if there's things that I can do to make your life better, and it's not going to cost me a fortune, if it's, ac if it's access to information or people particularly, whether they're into open source, whether they're bigoted and don't understand, please feel free to contact me, however works for you. Thank you.